and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Elizabeth L. Rosenblatt, Visiting Professor of Law at UC Davis School of Law. We will discuss her article, Fair Use as Resistance, which is published in the UC Irving Law Review. So welcome to the podcast, Betsy. Thank you. So it's such a pleasure to have you on. Uh, as you know, I've read a bunch of your work in the past, and I especially jo- enjoyed this one because it, it draws on um, concepts from literary theory, and in particular, the literary theorist Mikhail Bakhin, which I think are really interesting and a super productive way of of thinking about fair use. But for listeners who may not know that much about about copyright, copyright doctrine, and the concept of fair use. I was wondering if you could just kind of give like a potted description of sort of how fair use and copyright are related to to each other. Absolutely. So uh, fair use is an aspect of U.S. copyright law. Um, I describe it that way um, because uh, I think there are a number of different ways one might characterize uh, fair use. One might characterize it as a defense to copyright infringement. One might characterize it as an exception to copyright law. I don't think that either of those is a particularly helpful frame. I think the most helpful frame is to consider fair use to be an aspect of copyright law. And the reason I want to frame it that way is because Uh, If our objective for copyright law, which I think constitutionally uh, we we must allow that it is, if our objective is to promote uh, the creation of works of authorship, we need works of authorship um, to have something that they're based on. Nothing is ever created out of whole cloth. And the concept of fair use says that although Uh, copyright law, uh, by its nature, grants exclusive rights to authors uh, for limited times over their writings, Uh, fair use provides that that exclusivity is limited uh, by uh, the affordances of fair use. And those affordances say there are certain kinds of uses that are important enough that we want to allow them uh, without permission from copyright owners. And those uh, kinds of uses include uh, uses along the lines of criticism and commentary and satire and parody and educational uses and a variety of other uses. Um, I list those as examples uh, because the statute does, um, but the statute actually uh, is based on a sort of fuzzy, uh, an intentionally fuzzy a balancing test that sort of looks to how beneficial uh, versus harmful a particular use is uh, to determine uh, whether it should be allowed without permission uh, as a sort of function of copyright law. So in your paper, you frame fair use as a form of of resistance and make what I think is a really interesting and kind of provocative observation that, you know, resistance requires and in a sense is like a function of, of hierarchy. So I was wondering Mm -hmm. if you could talk about how copyright kind of creates, formalizes and perpetuates a form of hierarchy and sort of in an initial sense, and I'm sure we'll flesh this out more later, but sort of how fair use fits into that hierarchical framework. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, you, you've, you've read my article uh, as I intended it. So hooray. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, That, Resistance does imply hierarchy. I think resistance is uh, is something 
uh, at least in the sort of political sense that I'm using it, um, resistance is something that one does to hierarchy. Um, and so, uh, indeed, when I talk about resisting the hierarchy of copyright law, I uh, start by saying that I think copyright defines a particular hierarchy uh, and and an artificial uh, and unnecessary one, but one that is um, effectively um, baked in to copyright conceptually. Um, so we start, I think, with the premise that law is discourse. So we have to start there, right? If we don't all agree that law is discourse, we're going to have to back the bus up a little bit. Hmm. Um, but law defines and shapes values by articulating rights and wrongs, uh, assigning legal value to some activities and not others. So I'm starting from that standpoint. Um, and if we start from that standpoint, we then say, well, pretty much all law defines hierarchies because law says some activities are encouraged and some activities are discouraged. Um, and so people who do the encouraged activities are better than people who do the discouraged activities uh, from law's perspective, right? So that's, the, that's my starting point. Um, in particular, I... Uh, put forward the idea that the copyright system uh, ascribes value to particular speakers and creations by granting protection to authors and their works of authorship and not to other things. Um, and uh, it assigns that ownership differently. And it assigns that ownership based on a constitutional principle that uh, exclusive ownership promotes progress. So the implication of the law is that if the copyright law assigns ownership over a particular thing, it is the sort of thing that the law believes promotes progress, um, or at least it believes that ownership over that thing promotes progress. Um, and so it's uh, it's sort of rewarding um, and endorsing the activity of making that thing. Um, in contrast, if it doesn't grant ownership over a thing, it says, well, making that thing doesn't promote progress, or at least that's uh, one of the implications one could take away from the law. Mm. Um, so uh, as it happens, uh, copyright law says that uh, originators gain ownership over everything that they originate. If you are someone who fixes an original expression and a tangible medium of expression, you own that whole thing. Uh, if you uh, derive your work from something else, uh, you may own something, but you don't own what you derived your work from. You built on something, you don't own what you built on, but you own what you added if you added it legitimately. If you didn't add it legitimately, if you were infringing when you added it, you own nothing. Uh, you don't own anything that infringed. But if you added something legitimate to a previously existing thing, you own your addition. Uh, and then finally, if you add nothing, uh, that's copyrightable, nothing that's original to you that is fixed, uh, you own nothing. Uh, as such, there's a sort of users at the bottom, uh, derivers in the middle, and originators at the top hierarchy that, um, that copyright sets up. But, uh, and I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit, uh, I don't know where your questions are going, I would say the hierarchy is completely uh, artificial because, in fact, uh, although that is, uh, we can come up with rules that define originators and derivers and users, uh, 
it is a, a fallacy to say that anything is truly original um, or that anything is truly received without contribution by a user. Um, and from a literary theory perspective, right, reader, reader response theory isn't particularly novel anymore, but we all bring meaning to what we uh, consume. We do not consume dumbly. So but to say that uh, creator or originator, deriver, and user are different people is, uh, is, a, uh, is a construct that copyright has imposed on otherwise extremely blurry, if not entirely artificial categories. Um, yeah, So you right. want me to talk I mean, about fair use here, um, and maybe we'll wait on that? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I, I because I think that this is a nice transition moment where, you know, I mean, what was really interesting for me is the way there's a sort of, like, assumed hierarchy baked in the copyright law, but then there's an entirely different body of kind of theoretical thinking about how meaning creation works in practice through literary mm -hmm. theory that looks at the same kind of, as you might say, almost like holy trinity of, you know, producer, deriver, and consumer and sort of rather than putting them in a hierarchy, sort of puts them into a dialogical relationship. And, and I was wondering if you could talk about sort of how that reframing works and why it matters for thinking about the the creation of, of works. And in, in particular, your observation that there's a sort of reframing of the idea of a work from like a noun to a verb, as it were. Yeah. So I, um, it's funny, as you were talking, I something came to mind that I don't think I articulated precisely in the paper, um, but I've, uh, I'm currently working on another project um, that's about this very thing, this sort of transition of, or the difference between nouns and verbs and in, in how we treat things in IP law. Um, Cause you know, if I can get even more obscure and grammar nerdy, I guess I will. Um, but the, um, the I think we can frame the uh, the hierarchy that I just described as imagining a frozen moment in time. Right at any given moment in time, there may be an originator, a deriver, and uh, a user. Uh, whereas I think literary theorists uh, and reality. Uh, would would take that vertical moment in time and flop it on its side and make it a timeline. It, mm. uh, that uh, at the beginning, there is an originator. In the middle, there is a deriver. At the end, there is a user. And that user is an originator and a deriver mm. who, in, who in turn gives rise to additional users, originators, and derivers, who in turn gives rise to additional, right? So there's a steady forward motion of expression that builds on previous expression um, inevitably, and, and I think ineluctably, um, so that you can't ever define a beginning of this timeline. So the idea that there is such a thing as an originator happens only when you decide to just place your, to drop your needle on this timeline in one place. Um, but in fact, there always will have been something to which that originator was responding. So mm -hmm. Bakhtin, uh, the way Bakhtin describes this, he um, he wrote in Russian, so um, you know this is all sort of translated into English. But he really emphasized the concept of the dialogic, um, and uh, other IP scholars, uh, wiser uh, than I, have really done uh, amazing work on on dialogism and IP. Karis Craig being 
um, a, a real shining light in this area, uh, whose coattails I'm just riding to glory if I can. Um, but uh, but Bakhtin's concept of dialogism is very foundational, even to the point that uh, when you speak, you are using someone else's words to speak, and you must be, because in order for them to understand your words, the, those words must be their words. Mm. Right? They must have already associated a meaning with those words um, for your speech to have any meaning to them at all. Mm. Um, and so, right, so all expression is by necessity dialogue. If you express your, if you express something that isn't dialogic, it is meaningless to those who receive it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of a Wittgensteinian sense to that. If like, you know, the yeah. the like the if the lion could speak, as it were, right? I mean, it's like can't totally. participate in a dialogue with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so furtherance of the the Bakhtin theme, you draw really heavily on this concept to for which Bakhtin is really well known, namely the concept of the carnivalesque, right? Mm -hmm. And the both kind of dialogic, but also dialectical way mm -hmm. in which the concept of the carnivalesque works. So I wonder if you could, if you could talk a little bit about sort of what that meant in Bakhtin's framework and sort of how you transpose it into a kind of copyright fair use dialectic. Yeah. So, um, Bakhtin, it's funny, there, there is not a easy connection between Bakhtin's discussion of dialogism, which, by the way, I, I would be um, remiss if I didn't uh, mention that Bakhtin's work has been uh, sort of built on in really good, interesting ways by, um, by a, a lot of feminist scholars. Um, mm. So I don't want to be just saying like... I am parroting a dude from the 1960s, right? I'm actually, if anything, parroting a bunch of, pe of feminists who built on his work, but um, mm -hmm. uh, including Yulia Kristeva. Um, but uh, there isn't a straight line between the dialogic and the carnivalesque. They just both happen to come from Bakhtin. Um, uh, but clearly they're related in his, in his mind. And I, and I, I think, uh, and in mine as well, um, in the sense that um, the the when, when he talks about the dialogic, he often talks about what we call speech genres. So speech genres are the expressive norms of a particular form of expression. And he wrote a lot about the, the speech genre of the novel, like the forms of expression of the novel. Um, but speech genres, uh, can you can talk about them in very different ways. But the same word might mean a different thing in a speech, in a different speech genre, um, like the word bad. Uh, means something quite differently in, um, you know, in a Michael Jackson song uh, mm. than in a than when a mother is scolding her child, right? Um, and so, uh, it's, so, but speech genres are also the cadences and norms of particular um, particular forms of expression, and by using those speech genres we uh, bring meaning to words that is not merely the meaning of those words, but is also all the meaning that the speech genre piles upon those words. Um, and one of the speech genres that he discussed is the speech genre of the carnivalesque. So that's how he sort of gets to carnivalesque. So carnivalesque mm. is... Um, one of the speech genres of the novel, and uh, 
uh, it is particularly uh, evident in the work of the 16th century French author uh, Francois Rabelais, who mm. uh, wrote the uh, what we would, might call the grotesque. Right? He wrote, um, you know, sort of freewheeling, sometimes gross, often sexual, very physicalized uh, um, stories, uh, right? Books and novels, um, mm. and. Uh, his uh and Batine was a scholar of Rabelais, and so he discussed the carnivalesque in the concept and rather in the context of uh of studying Rabelais. And uh Batine defined the carnivalesque uh, by by reference to what may well be imagined, right? This may not actually have been a true thing about medieval culture, but Bakhtin <laughs> brings, this, I want to be clear here, this is not necessarily historical, this is literary theory, but Bakhtin yeah. brings this idea of a thing that happened in medieval times called carnival. And during carnival, uh, up was down, right? The authorities, uh, essentially the church, uh, were ridiculed and uh, the peasants uh, were uplifted to positions of authority, and there was revelry and mocking and a celebration of the physical and the grotesque and the sexual, uh, the embodied, uh, which is very different from the things that the authorities uh, valued in Bakhtin's sort of imagined medieval world, which were which was very repressive. Um, and uh, an authoritarian. Uh, and so the idea there is that the folk lived under very strict authority, but had these occasional opportunities to let off steam through at these officially sanctioned revels um, uh, that were carnivalistic, um, that upturned authority. Uh, and he likened Rabelais' work uh, to the carnival um, and the sort of idea that uh, he says literary technique like Rabelais is a carnivalesque literary technique that embraces humor and grotesquerie and physicality to upturn the authority of the more staid speech genres. Uh so that's his, that's sort of his, uh, theoretical turn. Right. Right. And so then you tie that in to your discussion of fair use by observing how in some ways it seems like fair use does some of the same things, almost like a kind of back talking to the authority of the producer through the reuse or recombination of previously existing works. Yeah. So I, uh, this, um, uh, to give some context to this, um, I, I have a, a good friend who uh, a few years ago was doing uh, a PhD in medieval literature. And uh, we got to chatting about the carnivalesque um, as one does and uh, the sort of conceptual frame uh, that she gave it was constrained free-for-all, uh, heavily constrained mm. free-for-all. And my immediate reaction was, wow, that sounds a lot like fair use. Fair use is a heavily constrained free-for-all. Um, and the more time I spent with Bakhtin's theory of the carnivalesque, the more I felt like the, the analogy uh, was very close because to the extent that the carnival that uh, Bakhtin describes was about upturning hierarchies, about uh, the, the folk, the peasant being uh, uplifted and the, um, the clergy being uh, mocked or uh, or uh, otherwise sort of denigrated in this playful way, uh, but only with on certain days and only in certain ways, and 
uh, only in, in very specific uh, kind of rule sets, uh, right? The, as a, um, a Bakhtin described it, up was down and down was up, but neither was sideways. I think that's not the, ex an exact quote. Um, mm. but, but, uh, there was, it was a very, uh, sort of, um, inverted approach to, uh, to this sort of, um, hierarchy. And in the same way, I think if we, uh, start with the hierarchy of, uh, creator, driver, user, uh, we find that fair use does exactly that. When you engage in fair use, you are a user who is elevated to the position of creator. Um, mm. and you bypass driver entirely, right? You're elevated to the position of creator. Uh, you own what you've done because you are, uh, you are, um, you have free reign to do it, but you only have free reign to do it within the confines of this uh, fuzzy balancing test that favors more transformative uses, favors non-commercial uses, favors non-competitive uses, and that sort of thing. Um, and mm. doesn't necessarily uh, say anything about derivers vis-a-vis -vis each other. Yeah, and this is the the really fascinating takeaway for me from your paper was this analogy between the carnivalesque and fair use really drove home to me the way in which it's a you know it's a form of transgression that recuperates and reaffirms the hierarchy itself. In other words, you can transgress, but you can only transgress within the terms defined and created by the hierarchy itself. And there's this very kind of Foucauldian quality mm. to that, that there's like this dialogue or this dialectic between the, the, the sort of the, the law and the transgressor where they need each other and almost define each other. And it's like the transgression only affirms the authority of, of the law. That is, that's exactly it, right? The, the idea that you have a sort of free zone necessarily requires that everything outside the free zone isn't free. Um, and the gates of fair use are policed by copyright owners. Um, and uh, even though fair use uh, allows this sort of temporary upturning of authority, the, the result of fair use is still a hierarchy of ownership. Derivative creators still will forever be subsidiary to uh, to the those whose works they have uh, uh, based their their works on, even if they're free users, uh, even if they're fair users, um, they'll never own anything about what they uh, derive their work from for very good reasons. Um, and uh, although fair use allows this sort of back talk. Uh, it doesn't necessarily grant power to backtalkers, right? It grants license to backtalkers to talk in particular ways, in non-commercial ways, in transformative ways, in non-competitive ways. Um, but it doesn't give license to, for example, pirate. Um, like if we really wanted a system that entirely upturned authority, we would we would be pro pirate. Um, now there mm. are plenty of good reasons why I think we're not right. But the true, the true resistor of authority is not the one who stays in their nice little fair use box um, and resists in this little constrained thing. The true resistor of, of authority is Aaron Swartz. Right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, but 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 even in the context of kind of the fair use and the sort of like 
um, limited transgression of fair use. It seems like you recognize an, an additional sort of sub hierarchy of like kind of this kind of fair use is okay, but that kind of fair use is not so okay. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like replicating that same kind of like this sort of the authority of the authority in absentia almost. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting way of putting it. I think um, the very fact that fair use needs this rule means that fair users are always put on, and this is Karis Craig's words, um, the wrong side of a moral equation. It, the fact that that one can frame fair use as an exception or as a defense uh, means that fair, there's always a sort of, there's always a but in our discussion of fair use, right? It's uh, it's allowed, but it's more risky. It's allowed, but isn't it a little lazy? Right? Uh, or it's allowed, but isn't it free riding? Right. So there's that element, and then then there's also the element that like, fair even fair users um, have to kind of stay farther away from the border if they want to be safer. And this may be what you're referring to, that the vast majority of the fair use cases holding things are, are fair use um, are about commercial uses. Like, you know, Campbell versus Acuff Rose is definitely a commercial use. And two live crew wanted to make money. Um, and yet the sort of... Um, internal with the the fair use communities uh that rely on fair use like a, a lot of fans for example um mm. or uh or samplers um say well uh you don't you don't want to um do that commercially cuz if you do that commercially you're not you know you're you're doing something that's riskier or you're doing something that's morally less upright Right? Or mm. samplers, um, right? You you gotta do that anonymously, uh, mm. uh, because you know there's a risk associated with with sampling on a, on a you know a large scale basis, or you've got to you know reinforce the hierarchy by going through a record company, right? But if you want to be the kleptones, you got to be the kleptones. You can't be the actual people you are. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. and, and so there's that high, there's that hierarchy. And there's also, I think this is, um, Dan Burke's, um, uh, Dan Burke commented that this may be the sort of most, uh, insidious thing about the fair work, fair use framework as a reinforcement of hierarchy that maybe fair use is just the little escape valve that keeps the peasants from rioting. Right? <laughs> um, because if you're allowed to make parodies and if you're allowed to do like a little sampling uh, and you're allowed to make like movie reviews, uh, then you aren't going to uh, engage in full-scale revolt against a hierarchical system. Um, mm. And so it may reinforce hierarchies in that way as well. Mm, mm. Well, I, I like your your reference to Campbell v. Acuff Rose in particular, because one thing that always struck me as kind of weirdly off about that opinion, even though I agree with it in many ways is the way in which it always felt like the court was sort of saying, well, we're kind of tolerating this particular use at our sufferance, you know, because it's like not really very sophisticated, but, you know, let them do it anyway, because it's not so terrible. And, and I, and it reminded me very much 
of, you know, your reference to some of Andrew Gildon's work mm -hmm. um, in sort of like almost like hierarchies within fair use itself, where it's like some fair uses are seen as like especially valuable and others are seen as well, you know, that doesn't really count so much or, you know, we're going to kind of judge the value of the fair use that you're making and to say that like, you know, you need to be making fair uses that are, you know, kind of contributing in a weird kind of roundabout way to the hierarchy itself. That, I think that's very insightful. And I think I would go even so far as to say, uh, we'll let you get this good, but no further. Um, mm. So Campbell versus Acuff Rose is, um, is, the first step in this, and I think you're right that there's more steps. So the first, so Campbell starts by saying, well, uh, Two Live Crew is allowed to make this song if it's a parody, right? Maybe not if it's a satire, um, but that's the implication. If you're making fun of society, we won't let you do it. If you're making fun of the underlying song, we'll let you do it. And this is kind of low class, right? We don't know if we find it funny, but we uh we will um we'll let it go because you know it's mocking Roy Orbison. Now uh that says to me that they're willing to do it only if it's carnivalesque, right? Only if it is upending mm. the hierarchy of copyright. If it's satire, if if two live crew were making a play to put themselves on the same footing, heaven forbid, as Roy Orbison, they wouldn't have allowed mm. it. Or at least they would have been less likely to allow it. But because it's parody, because up is down, uh, because this sort of, uh, you know, di a disreputable genre in the, in the vision of, of nine luminaries um, is, uh, is poking fun at uh the at at the classics um we'll let it go but if it were if it were a uh, sort of a legitimate uh you know commentary on society or uh, you know high quality music maybe we wouldn't let it uh, let it happen move now to um a, another case that was rather recent um, called um, Axonar versus Paramount, uh, or Paramount versus mm. Axonar. I don't remember who the plaintiff was now. It might have been a declaratory judgment action, but I think it was Paramount versus Axonar. Um, so Axonar was a uh, Star Trek fan film of sorts. Um, a, a filmmaker decided to make a really high quality uh film, a uh, sort of documentary style film uh, set in the Star Trek universe that um, told the, the story of a particular event that was kind of alluded to in one of the Star Trek movies um, and uh, raised a lot of money on Kickstarter and GoFundMe um, and or Indiegogo, one of them, um, raised a lot of money, hired some of the original actors uh, from Star Trek, spent a lot of money on special effects and made something that really felt like a, you know, Star Trek quality film, um, visually at least, uh, but very, sh but a short film and was raising this money to make a, uh, a feature film of the same, uh, subject matter. Uh, now fundamentally, this is a fan film, uh, in, many of the ways that matter, and it was a non-commercial product. It used uh, pretty modest uh, parts of uh, Star Trek in the sense that, you know, this was like a little moment in the Star Trek story that he was exploding out. And he used more substantial amounts of Star Trek if you think that certain things like the existence of Klingons is copyrightable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the... The, I talked to the um, to Paramount CBS's counsel about it, and I I questioned 
And it seemed like one of their arguments was, look, we're perfectly happy with a nearly infinite number of fan films, as long as they suck. But once they're good, we're going to stop them. And I said, that doesn't seem like it's consistent with progress or with what we want the law to do, right? If one fan film is fair use, if one non-commercial transformative fair fan film is fair use, and it's kind of looks amateurish, and another transformative non-commercial Fan, fan film is out there that doesn't look amateurish, shouldn't it by logic also be fair use? And his response mm, was, mm. well, no, that goes to factor four. That goes to whether it competes with mm-hmm. our product in the market. Um, mm-hmm. That a really high quality fan film competes with Star Trek films and TV shows, whereas a low quality fan film doesn't. Um, and also he argued that it was less transformative, right? That it's more like the underlying film. Uh, it serves mm-hmm. more of the same purpose as the underlying film. Um, and uh, that, to me, and that ultimately wasn't exactly what won the day, but it wasn't not what won the day either in district court. Um, Judge Klausner mm-hmm. wrote a, a an opinion that I uh, shake my fist at impotently because um, I don't like it. Um, and then we'll never get it fixed because the case settled between there and the, and the appellate court. Um, But that seems to me very similar. And in fact, the next step of the Acuff Rose uh, Mm. story that we're telling about hierarchy, right? Uh, Mm. right? If your thing is good, we're not going to let it be fair use Mm. um, because it's not adequately grotesque, Mm -hmm. Um, Right. It doesn't upturn authority. Mm. It tries to put you, the fan, on the same footing as us, the pros. It tries Mm. to put you, the user, on the same footing as us, the creator. And we we're all for the upturning of hierarchy temporarily and in this constrained environment. But let let nobody be confused. We're still the bosses here. Right. That's the story, I think, that this lawsuit advances yeah yeah well i can't help but think it's sort of like to put it into kind of this bakhtin's kind of area of study it's sort of like the distinction between folklore and apocrypha right Mm. i mean folklore is permissible because it circulates only among the people and doesn't kind of fundamentally change anything but Apocrypha has to be suppressed because it's heretical. You know, it it changes the story, the kind of the sort of the the sort of fundamental doctrinal story of the state. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I, that's a connection I hadn't made, and I love it. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're going a lot of really interesting places with this, Bessie. So I was wondering, kind of in, in closing, if you could talk about sort of what the next step in this project is and and what you're working on now. So I'm working on a couple of things actually that branch off of this project. Um, one I'm really happy uh, to say was um, recently accepted by uh, the UC Davis law review. So it'll be coming out uh, probably near the end of 2019 is uh, a race and IP piece. Uh, essentially uh extending out this kind of copyright hierarchy story uh, to a race and social justice place. Um, I'm talking about how um, there are uh, certain racially discriminatory effects um, that are baked into uh, copyright doctrine and the way it's uh, applied. And I talk a lot about music um, in that, although it's not I wouldn't characterize it as a music paper. A lot of the examples are music examples because, uh, as you might imagine, sampling um, comes in pretty actively to the discussion. And, and the cases um, that uh, about sampling show uh, enormous disrespect to um, rap and hip hop in a way that they do not show disrespect to similarly uh, 
uh, derivative, uh, but uh, historically white uh, forms of musical expression. Uh, so that's one uh, sort of vein that I'm taking this to, um, and I'm having a lot of fun with that. That's another one that's just been in the works forever, and I'm um, happy that it's now uh, emerging into the light of day. Um, and then I'm at the sort of early stages, um, but really want to kind of accelerate on uh, this this piece that I mentioned about about verbs and nouns. Um, cause if, if we're concerned with, um, the problems created by pretending that, um, that creation happens, uh, in a moment rather than extending it out over a timeline, um, the same is true, uh, not only for copyright, but also for, uh, for patent, um, and, uh, to a more complicated extent for for uh, trademark law. Um, and in each of those, uh, we take a word that could easily be described as a verb. Uh, work is a verb. Uh, mark is a verb. And invention, while a noun, is uh, certainly something one does rather than a thing that is uh, in common parlance. Um, and we take those and we turn them into nouns. We noun them. Um, and in doing this, I, I think we may uh, sort of overvalue and undervalue certain participants in the inventive and communicative process um, in that invention and expression are dialogic. Um, so, that's sort of where this is headed uh, next in my uh, in my theoretical research. Awesome. Well, I look forward to reading both of those papers. And Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you this evening, Betsy. You too. <laughs> strutting casually down the street when a man comes up to you looking beat with telltale traces of hippie on his chin you say howdy and he says hi got anything that'll make me fly and if you do i surely wish you'd let me in on what you're dealing brother in your mind you start to ponder what to turn this fellow on to and then you get a look into his eyes you find his beard is only makeup and his line is purely fake up Then and only then you realize that he's your friendly neighborhood narco agent Friendly neighborhood narco man, courtesy of your local FBI Your friendly neighborhood narco daddy, all American thinking fetty There to trip you up while you are high You're sitting in the coffee house gloom when the waiter comes up to you with a broom And he asks to sweep the floor around your chair When you ask him why, he says, routine, we like to keep our coffee clean And he proceeds to tidy up with care You light yourself a cigarette, find out soon as you got it lit That forty newfound friends are by your side Someone hands you a note that's pencil Telling you your flight's been cancelled Just the same, you're going for a ride With your friend the neighborhood narco agent Friend the neighborhood narco man Courtesy of your local FBI Your friend the neighborhood narco daddy All American thinking Betty There to trip you up while you are high Now you duck into an alleyway thinking, hey, maybe I can cop a J and get back before the boss finds out I'm gone. Remembering the golden rule, you look both ways, make sure it's cool, and when there ain't a soul for miles around, you clutch your baggie full of weed and careful not to spill a seed, you roll a joint as big as Baltimore. 
And as you take that first big drag in a helicopter, drops a paddy wagon, and guess who's standing smiling by the door? It's your friend, the neighborhood narco agent, friend, the neighborhood narco man, courtesy of your local CIA. Your friend, the neighborhood college dropout, undercover copper copout, keeping law and order bright and gay. Yes, you find out that the freak you trusted is a fink that got you busted. And 20 years is a long time to stay on the ground.